Next, Terry Pinkard discusses his biography of Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, a German philosopher who lived in the time of Beethoven and Thomas Jefferson. Among Hegel's works are Phenomenology of Spirit and Philosophy of Right. Terry Pinker discusses Hegel's life, his ideas, and his influence on today's political thinkers. His comments are about 45 minutes. Welcome to Bridge Street Books. I'm Philip Levy, the owner, and we're, we're here to celebrate the publication of Hegel, a biography by Terry Pinker, professor of Georgetown University. Professor Pinker and his wife, Susan Pinker, a dean of the School of Foreign Service, have been longtime friends and customers of Bridge Street Books, so we're particularly pleased to host the event tonight. Hegel, a biography <coughs> published by Cambridge University Press, is that rare combination of historical and philosophical depth with lively and engaging writing. Professor Pinkert's Hegel is a lucid and entertaining portrait of the man in his time. The work in its context and the revolutions and counter-revolutions which Hegel's work created these are ideas and events which continue to shape contemporary society, though I'll admit you'll have to ask Professor Pinkert for the details. I would just like to mention that this newly released book has already received rave reviews from Publishers Weekly, which called it a narrative of operatic scope, and the Boston Book Review, which ended its review by stating, by now it's clear that, Profe that Professor Pinkert offers the most rounded, richly filled out picture of Hegel as both philosopher and man that we have ever had in English. This will quickly become the standard biography of Hegel and richly deserves to do so. In an age of fine Hegel scholarship, this is a towering achievement. Professor Pinker. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, just a couple of words of what led me to do this at first. I, of course, have been interested in Hegel really for quite a while here. Um, can, you, can people hear me here? OK. I've uh, been interested in Hegel really for quite a while here, and one of the things that, of course, first drew me to Hegel's thought was Hegel's uncompromising modernity. Hegel was, in many ways, the first of a long line of people to try and think through and understand what it really meant to live in the modern world, what it meant to live in a world where all the old certainties had collapsed, and that from now on, we were, as individuals and as collectives, performing without a net. There's, and as Hegel liked to say, in this modern world, we're free sailing. There's nothing above us and nothing below us. That the old props that had held us up for so many years, the reliance on tradition, or the reliance on some form of sacred text, or the reliance on some unambiguous conception of what it meant to be natural, uh, or some particular shared religion, like Christendom, had simply vanished as having any kind of binding and authoritative force for ourselves. That these old props had, as it were, gradually and slowly rotted away from underneath us. So Hegel, as this great modernist, trying to think about what it really meant to live a life with nothing above you and nothing below you, where we are each individually and collectively making it up as we go along here, offered a a fascinating philosophical topic for me to think about, but as the years wore on, of course, I began to wonder a little bit more about who exactly Hegel was, especially given the controversies that have always surrounded Hegel's life. By and large, the picture of Hegel that has been bequeathed to us over the years is of a very stuffy, somewhat pompous, arrogant, very conservative, reactionary fellow who, for whatever brilliance he may have had, was an unpleasant individual. That didn't really fit well, that picture of Hegel, the person, didn't really fit well with the Hegel, of course, that I had been encountering in the text and have been teaching now for almost 20 years. When I started out doing the biography, I was, of course, curious to see exactly how Hegel's life and his thought would really interact with each other, and I was really quite surprised to find that Hegel, the person, turned out to be a much more fascinating and interesting character than even I could have given him credit for. Uh, he was a complex fellow. He was certainly no saint, but he was not the reactionary. He was not the stuffed shirt. He was not the arrogant, pompous individual that he has usually been made out to be here. Just a little bit about Hegel's life, and I'd like just to talk just to give you some more or less exemplary passages that may, may in some sense uh, break up the old and established picture of Hegel that we have. I won't talk too much right now about the philosophy of this. My question in this book, who was Hegel? Hegel was, first of all, he was the son of a minor-level functionary in Stuttgart. 
There were great problems in Hegel's family. Uh, his father quite clearly sided with his younger brother. Hegel and his sister quite clearly sided with the mother. There were immense tensions. When his mother died at the age of 11, and of the same disease that Hegel had at the time, what was described as gall fever, whatever that may have been at the time, Hegel developed a kind of uh, complex about this, of course, being the one who survived the disease, and developed a stutter for the rest of his life. Uh, he felt, in many ways, quite alienated from his family. In all his letters, he rarely, rarely talks about his father, but he often talks about his mother. His mother wanted him to be a pastor. Hegel didn't particularly want to be a pastor, but nonetheless, he was sent off to the university in Tübingen, in the seminary there, to study to become a Lutheran pastor. And while there, this young man, who, by the way, had graduated at the top of his class in his German high school, the gymnasium there, who had graduated at the top of his class, quickly became a rather sullen rebel. He ended up rooming with two other young men who had also been destined to become Lutheran pastors, Friedrich Hölderlin, who was later become arguably the greatest German poet of the 19th century and probably one of the greatest poets in the German language ever, and Friedrich Schelling, who also, in addition to Hegel, became one of the great philosophers and thinkers of the 19th century. They spent about five years together. During those five years, they formed a passionate love for the French Revolution. Schelling translated the Marseillaise. Uh, they had many friends who participated in it. One of their other roommates, a man named Wetzel, Wetzel uh, in fact, joined the French army, rather than taking his final exams at the university, joined the French armies, fought against the Germans, came back, took the exams, went back and joined the French armies, and then realized it was probably not wise to come back a third time, uh, and instead moved to Paris, where he became a uh, leading industrialist and, in fact, a manufacturer of pianos. Another fellow from the same seminary, a man named Reichardt, actually went to Paris, joined the revolution, and replaced Talleyrand as, Fran as France's foreign minister in the Girondin government. So there was lots of inspirational things going on at the time. On getting out of the university, Hegel, of course, didn't himself uh, do too well. But the first picture I think we can get of Hegel is Hegel is a young man. Hegel as a student at the university. His nickname among his friends, Herlin and Schelling, in fact, all his friends, there was the old man. The reason he was called the old man was because he was, in fact, very, very studious. This, of course, fits the picture of perhaps Hegel the bookworm. but. And this will let you know that university life perhaps has not changed a whole lot in the last couple of hundred years. Um, talking about Hegel's, in a section of the book where I'm talking about Hegel's reading matter and the book clubs he belonged to and the discussion groups, I come to this point and say, but Hegel's mind was not completely absorbed com in such abstruse matters. He remained a gregarious soul. And like many students before and since, he and his fellow students reacted to the strictness of their academic environment by forming bonds of camaraderie with each other. Hegel loved to play cards, something he appreciated as a schoolboy in Stuttgart and throughout the rest of his life, discuss issues with friends, and engage in friendly drinking bouts at the many pubs around Tübingen. These escapades, along with Hegel's continuous cutting of lectures and his continual oversleeping of his classes, did not go unnoticed by the proctors. And the records show Hegel being cited several times for such breaches of the rules. The records also show him being thrown into the student jail for a couple of hours in 1791. His infraction had to do with his having ridden on horseback without permission with a couple of friends to a neighboring village, and then having arrived back at the seminary too late. The reason he gave was that the horse belonging to one of his friends, a Frenchman studying at the seminary, had become sick. And Hegel and another friend, Mr. Fink, had refused to ride back without him. The result of Hegel's disobedience to the rules was some mandatory time spent in the Karzer, the student jail at Tübingen. And as is often the case with such students, Hegel also became fond of frequenting the taverns with his friends. His condition on returning to the seminary late one night prompted one of the older porters at the seminary gates to exclaim, oh, Hegel, you're going to drink away what little intellect you have left. On yet another occasion when the porter, same porter, I assume, admonished him with, Hegel, you're going to drink yourself to death, Hegel replied, surely in a slightly slurred and blurry tone, that he had just been out for, for a little refreshment. Uh, his sister remembered Hegel in his student days as a rather jovial sort who loved both to dance and to visit the ladies. So it was clear that this model student at least was no stuff shirt completely, even when he was the old man in Tübingen. On graduating, Hegel went off to become a house tutor in Bern. He went off with great dreams of becoming a private writer, perhaps, you know, in some sense, writing popular pieces for the German press, instigating a new political, moral, and social reform along the lines of the French Revolution. Instead, he found himself as a house tutor in a rather boring place for one of the most reactionary families in all of Bern, 
uh, and he never had any time to himself. He became actually fairly depressed about all this here. Uh, he ended up going over to another friend's house all the time where they would play the piano and sing Freud Schoener Goethe Funk in one of the pre-Beethoven settings here. His very first publication, by the way, appeared during this period. It was a translation of a French pamphlet, translated into German, that was attacking the ruling German-speaking Baronese oligarchy, which was led by the family for whom he was a house tutor. Uh, he also had a little commentary on it where he uh, looked to the example of the American Revolution and said, you know, something similar should happen in Bern. So there was Hegel, the young house tutor, translating revolutionary pamphlets, right, in the house of the people that he was working for while singing Freud Schoener Goethe Funken on the piano at his friend's house. Nonetheless, he was pretty depressed here. His friend, Herlalin, had gone on to a, a slightly better career. Herlalin was living in Frankfurt at the time as a tutor to a very wealthy family, the Gontard family in Frankfurt. Uh, he had also become a published poet and was already attracting quite a lot of recognition for his early poetry. His other roommate, Schelling, had gone on to stage a rather meteoric rise and become, in his 20s, a famous philosophical celebrity throughout Germany, whereas Hegel was stuck in Bern still being a house tutor and writing these kind of despairing letters to his friends about how things weren't going quite as he had hoped they would have gone. The friendship with the poet Herlalin especially was to prove very lasting and really epical for Hegel. Uh, in talking about Hegel's depression at one point in the book, I mentioned that in his letters to both Schelling and Herlalin, Hegel's depressed mood was evident. Seeking to help his old friend, Herlalin began immediately looking for a position for Hegel in Frankfurt. Discovering that a prosperous wine merchant, Gogol, was seeking a house tutor for his children, Herlalin managed to maneuver an offer of the job to Hegel. He announced this triumphantly to Hegel. The working conditions, he told him, are really quite good, and you will drink very good Rhine wine or French wine at the table. You will live at one of the most beautiful houses in Frankfurt on one of the most beautiful squares in the city, Rossmarktplatz. His employers, the Gogol, Gogol family, are, Hurdle then assured him, quite sociable, free of pretension and prejudice, who prefer not to associate with Frankfurt society folk, with their stiff ways and poverty of heart and spirit. And of course, best of all, the position is in Frankfurt, a bustling commercial center. Indeed, Herlalin assured Hegel, by next spring, you'll once again become the old man. The deep emotion Herlalin felt about being able to reunite with his old friend was only too evident. I am, he told Hegel, a man who has remained faithful to you in heart, memory, and spirit, despite rather variegated transformations in his situation and character, who will be your friend more deeply and warmly than ever, who will freely and willingly share every moment of life with you, whose situation lacks nothing but you to complete its happiness. I truly need you, dear friend, and I believe you will be capable of needing me as well. Herlalin warmly concluded, I still have much to tell you, but your coming here must be the preface to a long, long, interesting, unscholarly book by you and me here. Hegel, of course, accepted the offer and immediately went to Frankfurt. This became a major turning point in Hegel's life, during this period, Herlalin, had, who was now becoming more famous as a poet, was a still as a operating as a house tutor for the Gontard family. The Gontards were very wealthy bankers in Frankfurt. Uh, the, old, the husband, Jakob Gontard, was a good bit older than Herlalin, but he had married a very beautiful woman who was exactly Herlalin's age, who had high literary ambitions on her own, and he himself was a bit of a Philistine. Uh, there was this absolutely gorgeous-looking young poet hanging around the house, and, well, you can't imagine what happened. Uh, at one point, when the French army was shelling Frankfurt, in fact, Jacob Gontard instructed Herlalin to take his wife and children far away to Kassel for a month or two, which is about the worst thing you can do in those circumstances. On returning, Herlalin was fired from his position, although the two lovers continued to see each other, since Hegel was still persona grata, and the Gontard household. He would be the one who would make the ass assignations for the two to meet at various places. Another old friend from the seminary, Isaac von Sinclair, in fact, had become the minister in a neighboring principality. Herlalin was established as a librarian, and Hegel, Suzette Gontard would sometimes walk with Hegel over to uh, this little town outside of Frankfurt, right, where Herlalin and Suzette Gontard continued things here. This came to an end in 1800, here. In 1799, Hegel's father died, and as often happens with these kinds of things, Hegel realized that now, at the age of almost 30, it was finally time for him to get a life. He wasn't just going to be a house tutor forever. He had not yet published anything except this unknown pamphlet 
here, this translation of this French revolutionary pamphlet, which, by the way, most people never knew was even written or published by Hegel. When he died, his family sold it off as they thought it was some kind of odd thing he must have picked up as a student. They didn't even, his own wife and children didn't realize that, in fact, he had done this here. All right. Think of all the things you don't know about, right, about your parents here. In any event, Hegel and Herlalin had to drift apart. Herlalin went off to Bordeaux for a while, but on returning and learning that Suzette Gontard had, in fact, contracted both tuberculosis and measles and had died, Herlalin had a complete mental breakdown. Herlalin became a schizophrenic for the rest of his life. He lived until 1843. He never wrote, with one exception, he never wrote, again, of any kind of major poetry. He, lived, he had, in fact, instead to move in with a nice carpenter in his family here who agreed to take care, take care of him. And strangely enough, there was a carpenter who was a great fan of contemporary poetry and said, sure, we'll take care of Herlalin, where he lived in the city of Tumingen in a little house on the river then for the rest of his life, more or less stark raving mad, not knowing who he was, going by various identities, and just spending his time in his room talking to himself over and over and over again here. Hegel's life didn't get much easier. He managed to go to Jena, a center of learning at the time, exactly as it was falling apart. Uh, using his very slender inheritance that he had gotten from his father, he was able to support himself for several years, but he was not able to get an actual paying job at Jena. As conditions became worse, the Napoleonic Wars intensified, and the inflation set in, and his meager inheritance began to wear out more and more and more. In 1806, Hegel had no publications, no job, no money, no prospect of a job, and the landlady from whom he was renting his apartment was pregnant by him. Um, and as Napoleon was shelling the town of Jena, Hegel managed to complete his first major and major most important work, The Phenomenology of Spirit, in a period when he was immensely depressed and, shall we say, had a lot of other things on his mind. It was there that Hegel really formulated the typical Hegelian view of things, that we cannot understand ourselves outside of our own history, that who we are has to be understood in terms of who we had to come to be in light of all this kind of contingent past, and that now was the time for us to make the most sense of who exactly we were in this now free-floating modern world here. Despite the initial success of this book, Hegel still couldn't get a job and ended up editing a newspaper in Bamberg. He was a newspaper editor for two years, editing a pro-Napoleonic newspaper and becoming quite a bon vivant around town. He has some very touching stories, I think, which I won't go into here, about how he took care of all the employees working for his newspaper. And finally, he was able to get a job at least teaching, but this was at a high school in Nuremberg. So in 1808, he went to Nuremberg to assume position to teach roughly three to 400 students, several different classes. He was in charge of all philosophical instruction for the newly reorganized kingdom of Bavaria. And he also had to run the entire school district, basically, in this area. During this period, he completely resuscitated the, uh, the gymnasium there. He also wrote and published his book, The Science of Logic. He started working on the rest of his system to get ready this Encyclopedia of Philosophical Sciences, which was finally published in his last year in Nuremberg in 1817 there, and came out after he moved to Heidelberg. He also managed during this period to buck all the trends, and despite the fact that there was no money available, he managed somehow to get the money to set up the first women's school, uh, which, was head, which was in fact not only instituted to teach young women all the way through high school, but was in fact taught by women, uh, a young Miss Eisler, who had applied to come to the gymnasium where Hegel was teaching and was turned down because she was female, was instead uh, accepted as the first head and principal of this gymnasium. The gymnasium later merged with Hegel's old gymnasium in 1831. During this period, he married into the, into the Nuremberg Patriciate. He married Marie von Tucher, uh, an old, outstanding family. And it was a relationship that, as far as we can gather, was, seemed to be very close and very intimate and very happy then for the rest of their lives. This despite the fact that there was a 20-year difference between them. Um, there were, of course, some glitches along the way, as always happens when you marry someone 20 years younger than you are. But nonetheless, right, Hegel and his wife uh, had a happy life. They ended up with two sons, and they later took in Hegel's illegitimate son, Ludwig Fischer, into their house after the Hegel got his first professorship at the age of 48. This was the first paying university job he had ever had. His life was two-thirds over by that point. Uh, they moved to Heidelberg, and then shortly thereafter, Hegel got the job he had wanted, the position at the 
radically new University of Berlin, the university that by and large has shaped the form of modern universities that we know today, a university dedicated, as its founder put it, to teaching and research, to bringing the best minds in contact with the best young minds and somehow creating a kind of energy and excitement out of that that would last. The picture that you usually get of Hegel after moving to Berlin is that after he moved to Berlin, he became very famous, became very stuffy, became a reactionary, became the official philosopher of Prussian absolutism, as the, the old phrase had it. In fact, this isn't true. Immediately on getting there, his student assistant that he picked, a young man named Karl Wey, was arrested, interrogated, and then banned from teaching in universities throughout Germany for being too much of a liberal radical. Karl Wey had published some articles that uh, called for full civil emancipation of Jews, for example, for open admissions to all kinds of other things, for the abolition of special privileges for the aristocracy. For that, Karl Wey lost all prospect of academic employment. Hegel then picked another student, he thought this would be a little safer, a man named Leopold von Henning, an aristocrat, who in fact had been an officer in the wars against Napoleon, but also was in fact a liberal, who was immediately arrested also, put in jail, um, and for some liberal pamphleteering. Now, this is during the height of the repression, when the Prussian government is looking for absolutely anywhere, right, to find these subversives, demagogues, as, they, as it called them, and was throwing a lot of people in jail and firing a lot of professors from their jobs for being such subversives. Hegel already had two of his students in jail. Uh, a little passage from this. With Caravay having been rejected by the authorities, Hegel had to make a second choice for teaching assistant. Somewhat defiantly, he chose Leopold von Henning. Again, an aristocrat who had fought the wars against Napoleon as a volunteer, so on and so on here. I will skip the passages about Henning's arrest. Henning was held for several weeks with a policeman guarding the door to his prison cell. During von Henning's imprisonment, Hegel did something a bit extraordinary. Uh, he Henning's cell had a window facing the Spree River in Berlin, not far from the university and not far from Hegel's own apartment. Hegel joined his other students on a skiff, and at midnight they all rode up to the point at which Henning's cell window faced the river and began a conversation with him in Latin so that it could not be understood by the guards if they happened to overhear it. They wished to let him know that they were convinced of his innocence and they were working hard to prove it. As the boat pulled up next to Henning's window, close enough for Hegel and Henning to shake hands, Hegel, aware of the general absurdity of the situation in which he had put himself, uttered in Latin in a very mock grave tone, Num me vidis, literally translated, now you surely see me, which provoked no small amount of mirth among those present. He then continued with some vague generalities in Latin, and the group went home, the students amused, and probably a bit surprised by Hegel's ironic treatment of the situation, and all, probably including Hegel himself, joking about the matter on the way back. Uh, Hegel's first biographer, Karl Rosenkrantz, laconically noted, it would have been all too easy for Hegel to have been shot by a zealous Prussian watchman, and the history of philosophy would have been very much different here. Uh, this wasn't the, there were many other uh, things that occurred like this when his friend from France, Victor Cousin, was also arrested and thrown in jail in 1824. Hegel very courageously went public on, on a letter demanding Cousin's immediate release. Uh, there was a lot of problems with this. Even Hegel's friend said, you may be going too far this time, but in fact he was able to secure Cousin's release, something that uh, Cousin never forgot and in fact dedicated several books to him. Cousin himself later, of course, became the founder of the Ecole Normale Supérieure, a major French philosopher and a major figure in French education here. A number of other, um, uh, well, a number of other anecdotes. In fact, at one point in 1820, during this period of great repression, Hegel took his students to Dresden to see the artworks there. As they were all sitting around the table in the inn where they were all staying, the waiter came over with the local Meisner wine. Hegel rejected it, instead ordering three bottles of the most expensive champagne in Europe, Champagne Sillery. He poured the champagne around for all of his students and then said, you know, toast. And the students, of course, happily quaffed it all down, as students are wont to do. And finally, Hegel said, now, you do realize what we're drinking to today, don't you? And the students said, well, no, what? And he said, gentlemen, to the 14th of July, to the storming of the Bastille here. Uh, one of the students present was a young Jewish scholar named Edward von Gans, Edward Gans who later became, in fact, one of Hegel's closest students and one of the uh, major figures in the revitalization of the Jewish community in Berlin, and in fact was the person who um, wrote the obi official obituary for Hegel after his death. There was another fellow Hegel was great friends with in Berlin, a man named Moritz Safir, who was a Jewish humorist who used to dress outrageously. In fact, he wore different colored wigs all the time, you know, sometimes blonde, sometimes blue. Uh, he was uh, 
a famous jokester, none of the jokes really come across, I think, nowadays, but a very funny, lot, very funny guy here. Hegel was one of his closest friends. Sophia, in fact, used to come over to the Hegel household all the time. Hegel's friendship with Sophia, this is from the book, was typical of his dual life, as Hegel's son described it. Ever the proper bourgeois professor, Hegel also had a need to hang out with swift tongue artists, bohemians of various stripes, and figures somewhat on the margin of things. Both Hegel and Gans were Safir's friends and shared many evenings together with Safir. Safir even embroiled Hegel, or, well, Hegel embroiled himself in what turned out to be a legendary comical incident among that crowd in Berlin. In May 1826, a man named Karl Schall came to Berlin. Schall was a high-living, big-spending, grandly-eating, very rotund dilettante, a passionate devotee of the theater and of actresses in particular, who, after scoring big in the lottery, decided that Berlin would be a nice place to indulge his tastes. Like so many Berliners at the time, he was totally smitten with Henrietta Zontag, the beautiful, chaste singer in the musical stage in the main Berlin theater. People even spoke of Zontag fever at the time. Zontag was also a friend of, a friend of Hegel's. Safir, always the debunker, was of course, on the other hand, forever making jokes at Zontag's expense in his newspaper. As Sontag announced that she was leaving Berlin for Paris, a group of admirers, including Shaw, met at the Café Royale in Berlin the night before her last performance to plan an homage to her, finally deciding they would litter the stage with poems written in her honor immediately upon conclusion of the final performance. Safir remarked that he too would throw a poem onto the stage, but in honor of one of the members of the chorus, a young woman of, as it were, tarnished reputation. Shaw exploded at this perceived insult to Sontag, and claiming to defend Sontag's honor against Safir's insults, challenged Safir to a duel, which Safir accepted. The challenge was itself already absurd. Schall, whose size was round and grand, even joked that Safir, tall and very thin, would not make as good a target as him. <laughs> the duel was set for the next day. Schall and his second showed up. Safir showed up alone. All waited tensely for Safir's second to appear. Who, after all, in Berlin would agree to be the second for that outrageous Jewish humorist? Finally, a black taxi coach pulled up, bearing Safir's second, and outstepped, of all people, Hegel? All of which suddenly gave the scene, as one observer put it, an irresistibly comical air. From that moment on, it was clear that no duel was going to take place. Hegel persuaded Schall, he was also one of Schall's friends, to apologize to Safir, and everything was put back in order. Barely in wit had won the day. There. Hegel continued to battle with this. He, in 1826, there was a large birthday party celebration for him, which, because his birthday was so close to the king's, made the king very angry and banned, he, the king then personally banned all future publication about private birthday parties. Uh, it was, in fact, uh, bad enough that Hegel decided that the next year for his birthday, he'd better spend it in Paris. So he went to see his good friend, Victor Cousin, where once getting there, Hegel, who was a tremendous Francophile and loved Paris, he called it the capital of the civilized world. He wrote back home to his wife and said, from now on, we're speaking French, right at home, so on. Uh, he also found that, nonetheless, although he he really liked French food. It kind of got the better of him, and he became very, he became ill with indigestion, uh, and in fact ended up eating at a German restaurant the whole time he was there. <laughs> here. Uh, there is, throughout this, of course, Hegel's friendships with his two earlier best friends, Schelling and Hurlin, and always continued to be in the background. Schelling had gone on to become quite famous, but after 1809, had ceased publication, uh, although he continued to be a major figure in German intellectual circles. Schelling also became quite upset that his old roommate had eclipsed him in fame. And he began to grumble to everybody around about how wrong it was that Hegel had become more famous than him. Because after all, Hegel, he said, stole all his ideas from me here. Everything he knows, he got from me, and he just put it in slightly different terms. You know, I knew that guy back when, and let me assure you, he's not as smart as I am here. And then, of course, there was the case of Herlolin. At one point, Schelling and Hegel had even talked about trying to take care of Herlolin themselves, but they had agreed that this was just not going to be possible given Herlolin's rather deteriorated state. On March 6, 1830, Hegel was invited as the rector of the university. By this time, he'd, invited, he'd become elected as the president of the whole university to attend a luncheon with the crown prince, his, the crown prince's wife, and other members of the royal court. There was some discussion among members of the court as to what they should talk about with their celebrity philosopher, and at first, the conversation seemed to stall. In order to break the ice, Princess Mariana, the crown prince's wife, asked Hegel about his old friend, Isaac von Sinclair. The princess was Mariana of Hessen-Hamburg, the little town, of course, where Herlodin had been the librarian. Her father had been the Landgraf of Hessen-Hamburg, for whom Sinclair had been the minister. Sinclair, in turn, remember, had employed Herlodin as the librarian during Hegel's stay in Frankfurt. Her older sister, Augusta, 
had in fact in her youth had a great crush on Herlewin. Hegel suddenly came alive. His own memories of the heady days in Frankfurt with his friend Herlewin, now apparently living in the darkness of mental illness in Tübingen, welled up and he began to speak with great spiritedness about the area itself, remembering the name of each small hill that lay between Frankfurt and Hamburg vor der Herre, nowadays Bad Hamburg, uh, hills that he had so often walked with Sinclair and Herlewin. In her diary, this is not, her diary's never been published, in her diary the princess noted in an almost Proustian voice, at that point he began to speak of Herlewin, whom the world had forgotten, of his book, Hyperion, of which had constituted an epoche for me on account of my sister Augusta's relations to them. And I found by the sounding of this name a true joy, a whole lost past went through me. It was a remembrance, a remembrance awakened as otherwise would be done through a smell or melody or sound. The princess recalled her visit, vivid memories of seeing the sun coming through the window, window and seeing the Hyperion, her novel, bound in green lying on the windowsill. Hegel spoke of his now lost times with his old friend. It was not the first time in Berlin that Hegel had thought of his old and at one time dearest friend. In fact, Hegel had been a participant in an effort to get Herlewin's works published in Berlin. A fastidious lieutenant in the Prussian army, a man named Johann Heinrich Diest, had led the effort engaging one of several Prussian ministers, Princess Mariana and Hegel himself, who had offered much advice and spoken of the conversations that he and Herlewin had pursued on the topics of Herlewin's dramas. But alas, Hegel had to tell Diest he personally had no manuscripts of Herlewin's to offer for the edition. And finally, in 1822, a new edition of Hyperion was published, followed by new volumes of Herlewin's poetry in 1826. Hegel never mentioned Herlewin in his writings or his lectures. For Hegel, Herlewin was seemed to have been just an old friend. He tended, no doubt, to see Herlewin as someone who had not completely worked through the common revolutionary project that he and Schelling had begun as youth in the university. But it was clear, even though he never spoken of him, he'd never forgotten the person to who had. <coughs> who had the most influence on him and had been his dearest friend. For a moment with Princess Mariana, Hegel was not thinking of the present, but was lost in his youth again, reliving in memory his Frankfurt days. Hegel rose to a position of enormous celebrity in Berlin. And I think one of the things that's interesting is he never abused his position. In fact, he used it to help out young scholars. He was especially interested and always, always especially interested in helping young people, uh, tirelessly working to try and get them jobs uh, in the university settings and so on and also continuing his efforts to reform things. He even founded a popular magazine, the Yearbooks for Scientific Criticism, together with Edward Gans, to more or less popularize this kind of view. He suffered from a gastrointestinal illness, and the last year of his life was really one which gave great difficulty. He went to the opera almost every night, but then he quit going out at night. He was really quite sick all the time. His wife noticed that he just wasn't his old self again, although he could be very lively and very animated and his lectures were now drawing people by the hundreds, sometimes by the thousands. He had become, as one person in Berlin put it, a European phenomenon. There was nothing that happened in Berlin, either a new building put up by an industrialist, a new opera that was being performed, or a new play being put on the stage, but all of Berlin asks, what does Hegel think about it here? Uh, on coming back, there was a cholera epidemic in Berlin in 1831. Hegel, uh, gave some lectures on Friday, seemed to be very weak, went over to his good friend Zelter, who well, always went over on Friday night and played cards, usually whist, with Zelter and the royal stable master, and they'd always pick up a fourth and so on until late at night. Uh, he got up on Saturday morning, thought things were fine. They invited some friends over for dinner. At noon, he started feeling very bad. By roughly 8 o'clock, he was feeling very, very bad. And by the next day, he was having trouble breathing, and by 5 o'clock in the afternoon, he had died. The cause of death was pronounced as cholera, although I think it's quite easy to show this wasn't cholera, but something else. And this came as, of course, a great shock to everyone in Berlin. Hegel was suddenly, at the height of his fame, the height of his powers, taken away from everybody. The Hegelian school quickly split into the left and the right. The Hegelians began arguing with each other about who was the best propagator of Hegel's legacy. The Prussian authorities themselves were very unclear about what they thought about all this. One of the strangest events that happened was that Schelling, his old friend Schelling, who had now grown really quite conservative in his old age, 10 years to the day of Hegel's death, was given Hegel's chair in Berlin, and the official letter of appointment told him that his duty was to stamp out the dragon seed of Hegelianism in Berlin. Sitting in the lecture that day were three young men who had wanted to study with Hegel and had come to Berlin to get the spirit of Hegelianism. One was Soren Kierkegaard, the other was Bakunin, and the other was Friedrich Engels. Uh, you might say that at that point, 
history was knocking on the door here. Uh, Hegel, of course, later became appropriated by the reactionaries who wanted to claim Hegel as one of their own. There's a story about this, which I tell in the book, exactly how this happened. And strangely, by roughly the 1870s and 1880s, Hegel had become seen as the philosopher of Prussian absolutism, the man who drank a glass of wine every year to the storming of the Bastille, who celebrated the French Revolution, who tried his very best, in fact, to argue for a representative government, and as he put it, from power from below and this new form of life would suddenly become characterized, so it looked like for all history is in fact a stuffy, arrogant, pompous, you know, little pet of the state who had defended with all his might the powers of the absolutist Prussian monarchy. Not true. Schelling died in 1854. He never was the success that Hegel was. In fact, Bakunin, and Kierkegaard and Engels all were very disappointed at the lectures and left and went elsewhere um, here. Since Hegel's departure for Jena, his oldest and dearest friends of his youth, Herleven, had been living in madness in Tübingen, cared for by a carpenter and his family. Had even become, by the 1820s, a bit of a literary tourist attraction. And visitors would seek him out, talk with him, and often come away with a small piece of rhyming poetry as a keepsake, which Herleven would write for them on the spot. You could go and say, after you talked with Herleven, maybe bought him a drink, you could say, could I have a poem about, say, springtime? Well, sure, you know, you write these little rhyme couplets and sign them, usually Scardinelli. Here. But at the same point, most likely in the 1820s, perhaps, some, perhaps around the same time that Hegel was having dinner with the Prussian royal family and wistfully recounting with Princess Mariana, his time in Frankfurt with Herleden, Herleden himself, against the forces of his own madness, momentarily and for the very last time, regained his powers and composed his last haunting piece of blank verse. Alone among all of his poems, it's written in a woman's voice, addressed to him, that of his love, the long dead Susanna Gontard. It begins with the lines and prose translation of the German is much, much better. If from the distance that separated us am I still recognizable to you, the past you share of my sufferings? And it recounts in loving detail the enchanted days they shared in the gardens in Frankfurt, the fields which they had, which they had met after Herlin's dismissal from the Guntard household, meetings, of course, that Hegel had helped to arrange for the lovers. Even the flowers that populated the gardens of Hamburg, Fort de Herr, and the Guntard house. As the poem progresses, Herlin's sense of loss and the alienation that had settled in and over him in the ensuing years of his madness and isolation from his youthful friends becomes palpable. And it concludes, those were beautiful days. They were followed by a sorrowful twilight. That you are so alone in the beautiful world you always asserted to me, darling. That, however, is something you don't know. At that point, the poem breaks off. The German literary scholar Christo Christoph Theodor Schwab visited her little shortly before his death on June 7, 1843. Hegel died in 1831 talked to him about a number of things, and he asked him whether he ever thought of Hegel. Herlin answered, of course he had, muttered something incomprehensible, and then noted simply, we have to assume with a smile on his face, oh, the absolute. Thank you. Trevor? Could you, could you speak a little bit about uh, Hegel's writing style? I believe uh, Holderlin had a, something of an influence in, uh, in, uh, in, in shaping that. Well, of course, Hegel's writing style, in fact, is one of his most dubious legacies. Uh, I think it's pretty clear to say that there is probably no more obscure philosopher than Hegel, uh, which is, of course, very striking because when Hegel wasn't writing philosophy, in fact, was a, a brilliant uh, essayist. And when you read his writings all throughout his life that aren't on philosophy, he has a great way of turning phrases, he has a sharp wit, and so on. Then when it comes to philosophy, it gets very turgid. Uh, this has, of course, helped to fuel the Hegel legend of, you know, the pompous guy who's maybe, maybe a gas bag and so on. One of the, one of the things that Herleland had developed already in the seven, late 1790s was a view that modern life really required something very different, and that it required, therefore, a new language. In fact, Herleland had gone so far as to say that it required a new mythology here a mythology of reason, he called it, a new sensibility. And that for that new sensibility really to take hold, it was necessary for the poets and the philosophers to invent a new language, because you couldn't rely on just the old terms. If you did that, you weren't really teaching people to think for themselves. And the goal of all this was, of course, to become free, right? To learn to perform without a net, 
right, to really learn to live your own life, think for yourself. And to that end, Hegel then quite, quite defiantly throughout all his life, even though he was always told, right, that his writing style was obscure, said, no, I want to write in this kind of way here, something, again, he picked up from Herlalin. I want to write in this kind of way that forces the reader to sit down and read the book more closely here. I don't want to give them the easy way out. And I want them to be able to read the book so that they learn to think for themselves in this case. Uh, he followed this out in his own life. For example, he pioneered the use of teaching assistants. The notion of teaching assistants is actually one of the things that we also owe to Hegel. And one of the things that he liked to use teaching assistants for was so that the students could get out from under his thumb in the lecture hall and discuss the matter, even disagree with him, and so on. Uh, so this was, in fact, something that he picked up from Hertelin, although I think, it's, I think it, we can probably say in retrospect this is not uh, one of his best legacies and, in fact, not his most successful effort in this attempt to create this new language. Now, had we all been talking Hegelese for the last number of years, as, in fact, people in Europe are used to doing, it wouldn't seem quite as turgid as it does to our more timid Anglo-Saxon souls over here. Ah, uh, there. Uh, you can say a word about Schopenhauer and Hegel. I, I think Schopenhauer, the uh, kindest thing he said about Hegel was that he was a blowhard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, Arthur, Arthur Schopenhauer, of course, had um, no good words to say about Hegel. For him, Hegel was the, just the paradigm of everything that academic life and philosophy should not be. And in fact, a lot of the Hegel legends, the bad ones, all circulate about Schopenhauer. From, come from Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer tells the story that at his thesis defense, Hegel more or less inserted himself into it, asked some fairly stupid questions that showed that he didn't understand anything about modern science, uh, and was shown up by all the scientists, and that, you know, was just typical of Hegel. Of course, one of the things we do know, Schopenhauer, after getting his degree, nonetheless, defiantly offered lectures at the same time as Hegel. Uh, this was quite an act on the part of a 20-something <laughs> youngster to do, you must remember, in those days, professors not only drew a salary, you also were paid by each individual student for the lecture. You had to buy a ticket to be able to attend the lecture. So to offer lectures at the same time as another professor here was in effect to challenge his means of livelihood. So this was not taken very lightly here. Unfortunately, nobody came to Schopenhauer's lectures, and so he had to give up and leave town rather in disgrace, and he never really forgave Hegel for that. I, you know, I was curious about this, and I went back and read the faculty minutes. In fact, it turned out that Hegel had always been on the committee for Schopenhauer. He didn't barge in. Uh, and that Hegel asked him some questions having to do with the relations between reasons and causes. That a zoology professor said, oh, we don't make that distinction in zoology. And once Hegel saw that Schopenhauer didn't get it, at least as he thought he should, he said, well, your answer is good enough. And although the other members of the committee weren't, in fact, in favor, Hegel passed Schopenhauer on his dissertation. Uh, when Schopenhauer offered his class at the same time as Hegel, the rest of the faculty were outraged by this. They thought this was an insult to a Berlin professor and the young man should be chastised, perhaps even punished and so on for this act. And Hegel is on record in the faculty minutes saying, that's way out of line, we shouldn't do this, you know, we should be a lot more tolerant about these kinds of things. He is, after all, very young and so on. Of course, Hegel probably also knew nobody was gonna go anyway, but nonetheless, right, uh, in fact, Hegel was, again, I think, doing the right thing there. So. Uh, the relation between Hegel and Schopenhauer is itself an interesting piece of, you know, as it were, real history as opposed to the mythology that Schopenhauer him, has given us over the years here. Any other questions? Okay. Yes. Uh, to give a bi uh, biographical gloss on uh, Hegel's situation when he wrote The Philosophy of Right. Uh, Hegel wrote The Philosophy of Right. It was published in 1820. He had already pretty well written it in 1818, 1819, roughly. Uh, when the, there's another myth about Hegel that says that he had composed the philosophy of right, and then when 1820 rolled around and all these anti-subversion laws came into effect, that Hegel then rewrote the whole book. In fact, I think it's easy to show that the manuscript was already in press before the subversion laws had come in. What happened was that the publication date got put off because the censor had to read the book in this case. It was during this period that Carol Vey and Henning von Henning were in jail. Here. So the, at this period, it was a period of intense political anxiety here. Hegel uh, did not change the book and so on, and in fact published a book which in many ways was going against exactly what the conservatives in Prussia were arguing, because in that book he argues for a 
representative government, he argues, for a full set of rights that individuals should be clothed with, as it were, before they ever come into contact with the state, uh, and, and so on. So none of the institutions that he argued for were actually in place. And of course, the striking point, the book argued for a constitution which the king had promised, but which in fact he never fulfilled. And that, so that's, that's the, bio, the biographical gloss is, is in fact that. Now, you're probably thinking though of the preface where Hegel says, the rational is the actual and the actual is the rational. Because at the time, all of Hegel's enemies in fact jumped on that and said, see, Hegel's become conservative. Hegel thinks that what is, is right. And everything that happens to exist in Prussia is, is as it ought to be. Hegel was quite stung by this criticism because he made it quite clear he had thought that by this, this is now a little technical, by the phrase actual, the German term is wirklich, that comes from the term to be effective. What he meant by that was, in fact, that it's no use proposing, say, an ideal moral theory that can't be effective. It's got to have some grasp in people's lives. It's got to be able to move them. So constructing an ideal utopia is just pointless. Right? For it to be, it can't even be said to be rational to construct an ideal utopia unless you've got some way of bringing it about. In 1824, uh, the first edition of the Brockhaus Encyclopedia, there was an entry on Hegel. And from what we know, Hegel apparently contributed quite a bit to the entry, although it was written by, supposedly by Professor Vent in Leipzig, who also was one of Hegel's friends. And in it, it said, people have attacked Hegel, you know, for being rather conservative and saying that everything that is is right. Nothing could be further from the truth. As he himself has said in conversations, I have never meant to defend the interests of the powerful and so on at the expense of other classes. So that's, Hegel himself was rather stunned by the reaction, although one has to say that um, he could have put things a little more differently, perhaps a little more, yeah. Does that give you enough? Oh. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Terry, for wetting our appetite and giving us a reason to get the whole story by buying Eagle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very, for very much for coming. Thank you. Terry Pinkert is a philosophy professor at Georgetown University. He's the author or editor of five previous books. His biography of Hegel is published by Cambridge University Press. Biography on Book TV can be seen twice every weekend here on C-SPAN.